Okay, this one is a real toughie. Really hard to try to understand and conceptualize what's going on here, but it's super duper clever. I'm going to attempt it this first time around, but just know that uh, the only real way eventually, I'm trying to think of a different way to be able to explain this. You really have to have a bunch of construction paper in front of you of different colors and everything and cut them out to be able to see uh, how this puzzle comes together. So if you aren't familiar with Sanger sequencing, I'll come back and talk about the difference between these two things in a, in a second. Uh, if you're not too sure about Sanger sequencing, uh, this guy basically came up um, with a method for how to sequence bases in DNA. So what that means is if someone gives you uh, some DNA and says, hey, what does this DNA actually spell out? and you can't go in and look at it because it's super microscopic, the idea of DNA sequencing is that you'd be able to read the DNA fragment and be able to say, oh, uh, the sequence is this. It's an A followed by an A, then a G, then a T, then a T, then a C, then a G, then an A, then a T, and so on and so forth, be able to figure that out. Why do we want to know that stuff? Well, that is the genetic code. If we know that stuff, we know that genes code for proteins, we can actually find mistakes in them and help us to figure out uh, what types of mistakes lead to different types of inherited genetic diseases. So that is what DNA sequencing is. And this particular technique that Sanger developed really revolutionized how quickly you could actually do this process of reading. It seems so simple, right? It's just a letter, a sequence of letters. Why can't we just look at it and somebody just read it across? These are very small molecules. There's no way for us to be able to do that. And it, the A's, C's, T's, and G's are just representing actual different uh, molecules that are down there at that level in packed to every single one of our cells. So let's try to explain a little bit of the background. There are a lot of videos, animations that are available made by good textbook publishers that are available. You should try to watch as many of them as you can and try to piece together everything, uh, including what I'm trying to say to you here. It still took a while for me to be able to figure out a way to try to present this. So I'm gonna attempt to do this right now. If you don't know anything about how DNA is replicated, you might wanna make sure you understand that concept first because it's going to be kind of tricky to understand what these diagrams are showing right here. But the basic idea, if you understand DNA replication, is that the two strands are made in something called the five prime to three prime direction. It means one side of the DNA molecule on the left, if we're looking at it left and right, uh, one side of the DNA molecule up at the top will have a number five that that means there's the fifth carbon is pointing out. And then if you go all the way down to the bottom, it'll be a three prime. And the way to grow a DNA molecule to extend it is you have to add new bases that look like this to the end of a chain. It's just like making a popcorn necklace. If you have a popcorn necklace, you add the next piece of popcorn at the end. But the rule is for DNA, you can only add it at one end, you can't add it at the other end. That's what makes DNA replication a little bit different. So this is what a normal nucleotide looks like. So if you've learned about DNA structure, you know that DNA is made up of nucleotides. There's a phosphate, there's a sugar, there's a deoxyribose sugar here, and then there's a base attached. And this base could be either the A, the T, the C, or the G part. These are nitrogenous bases. So a normal base, you need to understand this, is called a deoxynucleotide triphosphate. If you can't get the word in your head, then don't worry about it. The point is, in my red circle right now, a normal base has an OH sticking down here. So if I'm growing a DNA molecule, how do I add the next base? Well, I attach it to this OH group right here. So this allows me to attach the next base. So if I have, you know, from the top, I have a, an A base, a C, another C, a T, a G. I get down to here, here's an A base. And then I wanna attach a G base. I attach the G base to this thing right here. The phosphate group of the next nucleotide will attach to this OH. That's really important because that's what's normally supposed to happen. But there's another type of base that we've manufactured, we've made. We've made this special base. So check out this dude over here on the right and compare it to the one on the left. What's the difference between this base and this base? This little red circle here does not have an OH. This messes up everything. Because there is no OH here, you cannot add any more bases down to the bottom. It's like making a popcorn necklace chain and the last piece of popcorn that you put on, you add I don't know, 
knives to it that's stupid you add knives to this piece of popcorn so that no other popcorn will dare come add on to the end of this popcorn chain that's what's going on here just by removing a o and adding just an h here in place if you're growing a chain g c a c a and then you get to this one and you get a t but it's a special t base that has this h guess what nothing else is getting added to the end of this chain that is so important for this particular technique of sanger sequencing you have normal bases called the deoxynucleotide triphosphates and you have the didio version so i'm going to refer to these ones the, the ones that don't allow anything else to connect as the didio versions so this is didioxynucleotide triphosphate so just for reference, this is actually the third carbon right here. So we count on like this. One, two, three, four, five. This is carbon five. This is carbon number three. So the messed up part is actually attached to the carbon number three. That's what all these boxes are saying. Didio version, non-didio. So here's the basic idea. Try to follow along. Imagine we have an unknown length of DNA fragment and we want to know what the sequence of those letters is in there. So what we're going to do is we're going to make the hundreds of thousands of copies of this thing and throw it all into a test tube. So inside a little test tube, there is uh, you know a million copies of this unknown fragment of DNA. And we're going to try to figure out what the sequence of letters is by allowing it to replicate normally. And we're going to try to use this replication to figure out what the sequence is. So into what else we need inside our test tube so i've got my little test tube inside my test tube i have millions of copies of the unknown fragment of dna that i want to try to figure out now in order for me to allow the fragment to make copies of itself i need to give it a supply of bases so i'm going to throw in you know a bunch of normal when i say normal i'm referring to this side a bunch of normal uh, t's a bunch of normal c's and a bunch of normal g's but from this first round, I'm going to put in a bunch of weird A's, a bunch of weird A bases. So all my G's, <clears throat> C's, and T's are going to be of this type. But all the A's that I put in are going to be of the Didio type. So there's going to be an A base attached here. But all the A's are going to have only this H at the bottom right here. So what that's going to do is that we're going to end up with a bunch of different size fragments. Why? Because DNA replication will happen normally, but every time an A is needed, that chain is going to stop. So you have a whole bunch of original fragments that are exactly the same. But each one is going to replicate slightly differently because depending on when one of these random A's comes in, the chain is going to stop. Nothing's going to be able to add to it. So you're going to end up in this test tube, you're going to end up with a bunch of the original molecules and you're going to end up with a bunch of new molecules. And these new molecules will come in a variety of different lengths because every time an A is called to the replication chain, it will stop. So there will be some, as we assume that the unknown DNA fragment has some A's in the beginning, some A's in the middle, some A's at the end. Every time there's an A, the replication is gonna stop. So if I could go in and look at all these pieces of DNA or these pieces of yarn, they would end up in different piles of different lengths of DNA. And I would know that in this test tube, all those different length pieces of DNA that I'm seeing, they all have an A at the very, very end. Now imagine that I repeat this exact process in another test tube, but this time in this other test tube, I'm going to put normal A's, normal C's, and normal T's in there, but I'm only going to put the strange messed up Didio versions of G. Now in this test tube, I'm going to end up with a bunch of different strands, different fragments of different lengths, but at the end of every fragment, there's going to be a G here because I put the Didio G that don't allow any more G's, any more bases to to attach to the end so i end up with you know an a tube with fragments that all end with a's i end up with a g tube with fragments that all end in g's i repeat the same thing for c and i repeat the same thing for t what a lot of work to create a bunch of different fragments these will all end in c and these will all end in t how is this of any use to me here is the really cool clever part if you imagine that these were actually bits of string and you pulled them all out and you have all these different length fragments that end in A, all these different length fragments that end in G, all these different length fragments that end in C and with T, and you laid them out 
from left to right, starting with the shortest fragment that you could find out of the pile of all of these four groups, and then the next one, and then the next one, and the next one, ending with the longest piece, you would actually end up revealing the sequence of the DNA. How cool is that? If the shortest piece had, uh, it was from, had an A at the end, then you would know that's the A. If the next longest piece had a G at the end, you would know the G is the next letter in that sequence. If the next longest piece had another G at the end, then you would know that the sequence so far would be A, G, G. If the next one had a C, the next longest fragment had a C at the end, you would know the next letter would be a C. So in the end, you would end up laying all these pieces next to each other and then you get, you know, sequentially longer and longer and longer pieces. And you would know that this one came from the A pile, this one came from the G pile, this one came from the C, this one came from the C, and you would be slowly building up your unknown sequence right here. That's exactly how the Sanger sequencing idea. If so if it took me a long time to try and explain and rub all this stuff in, it's because you really need to understand the techniques in order to get here. Now in reality, no one is going and taking these uh, fragments of DNA and laying them next to each other and measuring their actual length and figuring it out. That's yet another technique to help try to understand and finalize what's going on. So this I'm not going to go into so much detail because you'll see it uh, as another technique used in paternity tests to figure out who the murderer of a particular crime is, if there's blood left over at a crime scene. The technique is called gel electrophoresis. If you put all these things, instead of having somebody lay them out by hand, you can throw them all into a gel and the gel will actually use electricity to move these pieces. The bigger they are, uh, the less they'll move. The smaller they are, the more they'll move and it'll still create a sequence for you that looks something like this. I need to get rid of some of my ink here, but hopefully you can see through what's going on. So if this would be like the G test tube, this would be like the C test tube, the A test tube, the T test tube, and we allow all the pieces to separate, you end up with a picture that looks like this. The bigger pieces stay up here, the smaller pieces go really far down here, and if you actually read the sequence and know which column you're looking at, you can figure out the sequence of the DNA. How cool is that? One step further is that you can actually add a color dye to these, a fluorescent color dye, and get a computer to literally read the colors and then therefore give us a printout of the actual sequence. Before, however, uh, before we figured out this fluorescence method, like people would actually have to go and look and by hand look at this diagram and be like, okay, and then write with letters with with their with a pen they'd write a then t then a then a then a then a then a then a this one's going to be a uh, a c this one's going to be a t next one's going to be a, a c next one's going to be an a and they go out and figure this out obviously that can produce lots of errors and errors did show up believe it or not that's how they figured out i might be getting this wrong that's how they figured out the mistake in genes that causes the disease for cystic fibrosis by going through and doing this particular method. But now it's all computerized because you can add fluorescent dyes. Like I said, there are videos out there that illustrate this process, but it's still difficult to wrap your head around the entire thing. So hopefully you understand what's going on. Pause the video, read through these bullet points and make sure you understand what that's saying. I try to write it in as few words as possible and it still ends up looking crazy. Again, lots of techniques. You need to understand how DNA replication, gel electrophoresis, and a bit of common uh, logic and uh, problem solving can help you to understand how Sanger sequencing uh, actually works. So super cool stuff, a lot of applications for uh, helping us to figure out how to cure genetic diseases. Sorry that was so long, but this is a toughie, like I said. It's a true toughie.